Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in program number three this afternoon. And again, for those of you joining us on television, we just like to invite you to an informal Bible study. That's why we've got coffee cups and what have you. And uh, we just want to uh, be like a home Bible study where we can just fellowship together and uh, learn to search the scriptures. That's all I can beg people. Just search the scriptures. If you haven't got a good study Bible, go out and buy one. That's be the best money you've ever spent. Okay, we're uh, spending the afternoon on what Joel, way back in the Old Testament, 800 and some years before Christ, used the term, the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is that last seven years of time before Christ returns and sets up his kingdom. All right, my little wife gave me a note to remind you that this is the beginning of book 71. Now, you see why I couldn't do it without her? She, she just got to keep me on top all the time. I just couldn't do it without her. So I, I mean that. She is uh, a lot of help in a lot of different ways. Okay, so as we are looking now at the day of the Lord, we've been coming up through the Old Testament a few portions, and now I'm going to jump into the new. Come with me to Matthew 24. And now this is the words of the Lord Jesus himself toward the end of his earthly ministry. And uh, the twelve are getting curious. How is all this going to come to an end? They, they understood that he was going to be bringing in the kingdom. As yet, uh, in Matthew 24, they don't know he's going to be crucified and die. But they do realize that there's an end to this human program that has started well, at their point in time, 4,000 years, and now it's 6,000, see? All right, Matthew 24, we'll just start at verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple, which you've got to understand, the temple wasn't just that one little building. It was a whole complex, and uh, it involved a lot of various activity. In fact, I think a lot of the apartments of the priests and so forth were involved in that temple complex. All right, so he said unto them, verse 2, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Which, of course, happened when the Romans came in in 70 AD, 40 years later. And the Romans literally took the temple down stone by stone. All right, verse 3. So as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples, the twelve, nobody else, came unto him privately. <clears throat> In other words, no press of crowds or anything like that. And the twelve said, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the ages? And Jesus answered and said, Now here he begins unfolding the events that will roll through those seven years of tribulation. And the first warning was, be not deceived. So, that tells us that verse 5 is already happening. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, or the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. And they shall deceive many. Now, I just made the comment. I hope I didn't confuse you. These are all things that will take place as soon as the tribulation or the day of the Lord begins. It's going to be a tremendous outpouring of satanic deception. But we're seeing the beginnings of it. You remember, uh, I think in my last tape I mentioned, I know I did in several of the seminars around the country. You remember when the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees taunted Jesus and... Uh, about uh, end time events and so forth. And what was Jesus' response? Oh, he says, you hypocrites, you can look at the sky and predict tomorrow's weather, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Well, I've been using that for the last 12 months or so as I travel to wake people up. What are the signs of the times? The signs that the end is near. Well, the number one sign for us today is the return of Israel to the land. That is the number one sign of the times. 
because we know that you can have no end time prophecy until Israel is back in the land. So there you are. And the same way here. Jesus is warning the twelve that there's going to be coming a time of deception like the human race has never seen before. Now again, remember what we showed on the timeline. That all these prophecies were going to come right one after the other. And after even Christ is crucified and he's raised from the dead, he'll go back to glory. In would come the day of the Lord, those final seven years. Christ would return and yet set up the kingdom. I guess we got it up there on the board. That's the Old Testament line of prophecy. Now remember, keep the church age out because that is not revealed until we get to the Apostle Paul. Okay, so now then, one of the signs of the tribulation would be a great influx of false messiahs. And he says, they'll call themselves Christ and shall deceive many. Now verse 6, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But it's not the end yet. Now I feel that the wars and rumors of wars that he's talking about here is what we talked about in the last program. When the Russian invasion will come in the very first year of the tribulation, all of a sudden that euphoria of peace is blown away with this tremendous horde from the north. And Israel especially will be suddenly de de bereft of any peace because the land is covered with foreigners. All right, so wars and rumors of war. Verse 7, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. Again, we're seeing just a little bit of the beginning of this. But he's speaking of the real thing. This is the future of those final seven years. All right, verse 8. All these, the famines, the pestilence, the earthquakes, they're just the beginning. That's at the very first year or so of the seven. Verse 9. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted. Now, who are the you? Israel, the Jews. And listen, anti-Semitism is just compounding by the week. The world is hating the Jew more and more every day. And so we're already seeing the signs of this. All right? They will afflict you. They will kill you. You shall be hated of all nations. They won't even have America as a friend or ally once the tribulation begins. Then verse 10. Many shall be offended and shall betray one another because of the pressures of hatred and persecution. One will tell on another. And they will hate one another. Verse 11, many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. See, it's going to be a satanic deception that will overcome even the work of the Holy Spirit, who I feel will stay on the earth even after we're gone. All right, now then, verse 12, because iniquity, wickedness, shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. In other words, they'll just turn against anything spiritual. And then verse 13, but he that shall endure to the end physically, they're going to come to the end of the seven years, and goodness sakes, they're still alive. They haven't been martyred. They haven't been killed. They're alive. All right, that's what he's speaking of. That those who endure to the end shall be saved physically. We're not talking about a spiritual salvation in that verse as I can see it all. Now then, verse 14. Yes, during the tribulation, the 144,000 of Revelation 7 will be preaching not the gospel of the grace of God. They're going to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I know that gets people all bent out of shape when I proclaim that there are two Gospels in the New Testament. They're not active today. Of course not. We only have the Gospel of the grace of God today. But in Christ's earthly ministry and Peter and the Twelve, they preached what Jesus calls the Gospel of the Kingdom. And the Gospel of the Kingdom was the good news of the King. The grace of God is the good news of the finished work of the cross. Big difference. 
All right, and so when the church is gone and the gospel of grace ends, the 144,000 will go around the world preaching again the gospel of the kingdom. And I don't know why that's so hard for people to swallow, but it is. Boy, I get more on that than anything else. But here it is, the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Now I take the approach and I don't mind if people disagree. And uh, I, well, just this last week, you know, I had a couple calls where they disagree on something so far removed from the gospel. That it's not. Even, and I said, now look, if I'm right and you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong, is that going to determine our eternal destiny? No. Well, then it really doesn't matter, does it? See? And that's where it's at. If it doesn't affect our salvation, our eternal death, hey, we can have some disagreements. That don't bother me a bit. It's moot. What difference does it make? For example, you know, there are those who think the world is 120 million years old. And others say, no, it's only 6,000. You know what I say? What difference does it make? Does it make any difference? You know, I tell geologists, oil people, does it make any difference where you tell your engineers to drill if the world's 200 million years old or if it's 6,000? Well, no. So it doesn't make a bit of difference, does it? And yet they can get all bent out of shape. Well, the same way here, see? We have this gospel of the kingdom that Jesus and the Twelve proclaimed to Israel, and the 144,000 are going to take that same gospel of the kingdom around the world during the tribulation. The church is gone. The gospel of grace is ended. And multitudes are going to be saved by it. God's sovereign. He can do it any way he wants. And so, yes, they are going to fulfill the Great Commission like no one has ever even come close. All right, now then, verse 15. Here we come to the midpoint of those seven years. Now, I'm going to make that as a separate series of references in a little bit. I'm first looking at the physical things concerning the tribulation, the horrors, the death, and destruction. Then we're going to look at the time element, that it is indeed seven years. And then we're going to look at the personalities that are involved, the Antichrist and the false prophet and so forth. So we may not get through this afternoon. We'll continue next month. But here in verse 15 now, the Lord Jesus is continuing on through the seven years of tribulation, and he reaches the midpoint. And he says in verse 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now let's go back and see what Daniel wrote. It's the only way we can do it. Come back to Daniel chapter 9. And this is the confirmation that Daniel knew exactly what he was talking about when he wrote by inspiration that in prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, we have to drop down to verse 24. Now remember why I'm coming here. The Lord Jesus is using this portion of Scripture to define the events of those final seven years that are coming. And again, remember, he doesn't give any hint that there was 2,000 years in between all this. It was all just going to keep coming. Always remember that. The Old Testament knew nothing of the church age. Knew nothing of our gospel of grace. All, everything in the Old Testament was dealing with Israel and her Messiah her coming king, and an earthly kingdom. All right, but now here's Daniel. By Holy Spirit inspiration, writes, starting at verse 24, chapter 9, 70 weeks of years, or 70 sevens, or 490 years, are determined in God's program now upon thy people, Israel. And upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, that is, the kingdom. In other words, 490 years are going to take place from a point back here in the Old Testament. It's going to be between the 400 and the 600, right about in here, in uh, 454 B.C., 
when Nehemiah was given the command to go back and rebuild the city wall around Jerusalem. That's what it's based on. From that point until Christ would be crucified would be 483 years, and then there would be another seven, and it would bring in the kingdom. So 490 years would be involved fulfilling the Old Testament, Christ's coming, the seven years of tribulation, and the kingdom. That's the 490 years that are determined upon the nation of Israel. Okay, now then as you come down through verse 25, he breaks it down. Know, for, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the wall, to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's for a total of 483 years from Nehemiah until the crucifixion. 483 years. But the whole prophecy is 490. So we got seven years left. All right, now you come on down through verse 26. After the 483 years, Messiah will be cut off, not for himself. In other words, he died for us. He didn't die because he deserved it. And then here comes the prophecy. The people of the prince that shall come. Now, the prince that shall come will be the personality that we're going to look at sooner or later, the Antichrist. And he's going to come out of the Roman Empire. Now again, I always like to use my timeline. As you come up through the Old Testament from 600 B.C. until you get to the time of Christ, you have the Babylonian Empire, the Mede and Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And you all know that Rome was part and parcel of the crucifixion. All right, so out of the Roman Empire then, in the prophecy line of the Old Testament, would come the Antichrist. Because Rome is over all this. Now remember, i got to keep this out of you, right? I should have made a second timeline, I guess, but whatever, uh, I didn't. So now we're going to use this line strictly as the seven years of tribulation, which we got here. Forget about the church age for now. That's just not involved in our Old Testament line of prophecy. Just keep it out of your mind for the time being. And then we're going to drop down and look at those seven years on a larger scale uh, timeline. Okay, Daniel chapter 9 once again. Verse 26, after the Messiah is cut off, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. And we know that Rome did. Under Titus, 70 A.D., they destroyed the city and the sanctuary, in other words, the temple, and then the end thereof shall be with a flood, and to the end of the war desolations are determined. See, there's nothing to indicate a break in the timeline. It's all going to flow. All right, now verse 27. This prince that shall come, we call him the Antichrist, and I'll deal with that a little later. This prince that shall come will confirm or make a covenant or a treaty with many for one week. Now someone called or wrote a while back with an interesting statement. And they had a thought that I can't uh, ridicule one idea. The Oslo Peace Accord that was put together back in Clinton's time, wasn't it? That Oslo Peace Accord has almost everything in it that would bring about the peace treaty that the Antichrist will sign. And so this writer, I think it was a lady, and she said, you know, Les, if that be the case, all they have to do is bring that thing back up and this man, Antichrist, can just simply agree this is exactly the way we want to do it, and it'll be confirmed, and it's in place. Well, that just tells us how close we really are, that all the details of this necessary treaty are pretty much agreed upon already, see? All right, but anyway, he's going to make a seven-year treaty between the 
nations of the world, predominantly, I think, now the Muslim world, and Israel, and it will give them, as I said earlier today, permission to rebuild the temple. Now, here's what the Lord Jesus was referring to. Remember what he said in Matthew? When you see the desolation spoken of by Daniel, here it is, this verse 27, that in the middle of the week, in the middle of those seven years, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to stop. Now you stop. Can you stop something that hasn't started? Now you know there's no sacrifice and oblation going on in Jerusalem today. And it can't until they have a temple. So what does this tell us? That in those first three and a half years, as a result of this peace treaty, Israel is going to rebuild a temple. And it doesn't have to be a glorious golden cedar like Solomon's, but it'll be functional. And I personally think it's in a warehouse in Jerusalem right now, all ready to pull out and set up, and it'll be functioning in less than a week's time. And so they'll go back under temple worship for the first three and a half years, and then the Antichrist will turn on Israel, and we'll look at that again in Matthew 24 in just a little bit. And in the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation or temple worship to stop. He's going to turn on the Jew. And for the overspreading of abomination, he, the Antichrist, this prince that shall come, will make it that restored temple, desolate, inoperable so far as Judaism is concerned, and it'll remain that until the consummation, that is, the end of the seven years, and that which is determined shall be poured upon the desolate or the desolator. In other words, the Antichrist will meet his doom at the end of the tribulation. All right, now let's come back to Matthew 24. Back to Matthew 24. <clears throat> now, this is exactly what Jesus is referring to in verse 15. We are now at the midpoint of the seven years. These first 14 verses are the first half. Now we start the second half. And when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. He's in the temple defiling it. Whoso readeth, let him understand then. Now, those of you who have heard me teach over a period of time, what kind of a word is then? It's a time word. When the Jews see the desolation taking place up there on the Temple Mount, the Antichrist defiling it probably by sacrificing a hog, and Israel will just be beside themselves. But the Lord says, when you see that, wake up, get out of town. That's the way we'd put it today. Get out of town. Here we go. Verse 16, Then let them who be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now I call this the escaping remnant of Israel. Now we have to have the remnant that will come through the tribulation and ready to go into the kingdom. You have to have the nation of Israel. But it won't be the whole nation. It'll be a remnant. Now let's see. I'm going to take the time. Keep your hand in Matthew again and come back with me to Zechariah. Zechariah. Oh, I thought for a minute I had the wrong book. <laughs> Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13. Starting at verse 8. Now remember, this is prophecy again, so it's going to happen. Even though we may think it's kind of ridiculous. Zechariah, that's the next to last book in your Old Testament. You know, I always tell people, find Matthew. You can all find that. And then just go to the left, past Malachi, and there's Zechariah. Chapter 13, verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, that is, the whole land of Israel, 
saith the Lord, two parts or two thirds shall be cut off and die. The third shall be left therein. They're going to survive. Now verse 9, I will bring the third part through the fire. Now the fire here is the tribulation, the horrors of it. And I will refine them as silver and try them as gold. And I will hear them and I will say it is my people and they shall say the Lord is my God. So that's the remnant. All right, back to Matthew 24. So the remnant now is fleeing out of Jerusalem at the middle of the tribulation. All right, we're just going to do this quickly. Verse 16. Let them who be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them who is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Time is of the essence, is the way I usually put it. Don't take time to find some heirloom or something of value. Get out of town. Verse 18. Neither let him who is in the field, the working class. Now, for Israel today, that would be the scientists, the medical people, the business people, because Israel is no longer an agrarian nation like it was at the time of Christ. And so the whole cross-section of the nation now is involved in these verses. Verse 19, Woe unto them that are with child and those that are nursing, young mothers. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, because Jerusalem gets 12, 40 inches of snow every once in a while. Pray also that it be neither on the Sabbath day, so that they would be limited on how far they could walk. Now here's the verse I want to end with. Verse 21. For then, beginning with that desecration of the temple, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, the time of Christ, or ever shall be, which takes us right on up past our own day and time, including the Holocaust. So that should tell you something. That for Israel, as well as the rest of the world, the time is coming in these last three and a half years that's going to be worse than anything in all of human history. It's going to be beyond comprehension. And that was in the words of the Lord Jesus himself, that there is nothing in all of human history that compares with this last three and a half years. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.